Uh, let's see how uh, we're doing with our understanding of ver. Uh, this is similar to that uh, other problem that you didn't turn in, number 60. Uh, we have a tension force pulling with 50 newtons to the right. It's moving to the left at three uh, distance of three meters. What is the vert done by the tension force? Okay, last call, get your answer in. Okay, the answer is D. Now, folks, you don't really need your calculator for this one. I mean, think about it. It's pulling to the right while the block is moving to the left. Your answer has to be negative. There's only two possible answers up here, the answers that are negative. And if you look at this answer, that's going to be the full 50 newtons times the full distance. The fact that you're at an angle means that not all of that force is, is doing negative error. And so really, the only possible answer up there is D. Um, the others are all uh, totally impossible, nonsensical. Okay, last day we talked about the energy stored in the spring. Remember, energy is the capacity to do damage. And a spring that is compressed or stretched has the capacity to do damage. And it's given by that formula, trust me, until later today. Okay, today's when I come clean and I show you where this comes from. I'm kind of happy about that. Now, last day, we left off with this problem. Let me just remind you, we had a hand push that spring, uh, compress that spring by half a meter. Now, if that spring has a spring constant of 16,000 newtons for each meter, then the energy stored is going to be given by that formula, one half times K, times the compression squared. Now the most common mistake on the next exam will be that square there. Many of you will forget it. Many of you will write it and not do it. Look at your neighbor right now and say, it's going to be you, not me. Okay? Now, if I take a half and square it, I get a fourth. Half of a fourth is an eighth. An eighth of 16,000 is 2,000 joules. Now, that's the total energy of the system because the block's not moving and the block is on the floor. Now, we release the block and we ask, how, how much kinetic energy does the block have when it gets away from the spring. The simple way to answer this is to say, hey, I had, had 2,000 joules, and I didn't get robbed. I'm on a frictionless floor. There's, there's nothing that's taken energy away, and so I must still have 2,000 joules, but now it's in the kinetic energy bucket. And that allows me to figure out how fast the block is going. If I now use the formula for kinetic energy, <laughs> I have 2,000 joules of this kinetic energy. That's equal to 1 half times 10 kilograms times the velocity, the speed at A squared. That gives me 400 is equal to the speed at A squared, and that gives me the speed at A of 20 
meters per second. Easy. Now we get to the point where we left off. That block hits the rough place at B and starts scraping. And the question is, how far will it scrape before it stops? And uh, with your neighbor, see if you can come up with an answer for that. How far will it scrape before it stops? <laughs> and as soon as someone gets an answer, raise your hand. Share with the class. <laughs> yes, sir. No, that wasn't a hand up. <laughs> yes, sir. Hundred meters is the correct answer. Good job. Good job. Okay, let's do it together as a class, because some of you seem not to have gotten that answer. If I go back to our uh, derivation that we did for the kinetic energy, we found that this combination of force times distance is what changes kinetic energy. We call it the vera. Now if I replace those one-half mv squareds with just their symbol, I'm going to write this in a way that that makes more sense, I think. If I take the initial kinetic energy and bring it to the other side of the equal, it becomes positive. And then if I replace the left with the right, it looks like this. Now the way I read this is, the kinetic energy in the morning is equal to the kinetic energy in the evening, except when it's not, and it's usually not. Now, in this example that we derived this formula for, we had a block on wheels on a level, flat surface. Now, there were no springs, so there was no spring energy possible. We called the height of that level surface zero, so there was no gravitational energy. The only kind of energy possible for this block was kinetic energy. Well, in most problems, you have different types of energy possible. And in those problems, we have to generalize this equation to that. We call that the Verk energy equation. And it's the one equation to rule them all and in the darkness bind them, okay? And we read this again, the energy initial is always, always, always equal to the energy final except when it's not, and it's usually not. Now, folks, here's the thing about energy problems. That's always the first step. If you were to take a blank piece of paper and write that at the top and Xerox it 20 times, you would have your stationary for the next week and a half. Every time you had an energy problem, you'd just take one of those sheets you'd be halfway done. And that's the other nice thing about energy problems, is that's halfway done, okay? All you gotta do from here is decide what kinds of energy you have at the initial event and the final event. To do that, you just ask yourself three questions. Is anything with mass moving? If yes, you got kinetic energy. Is anything up off the floor? If yes, you got gravitational energy. Are any springs compressed or stretched? If yes, you've got spring energy. Now, what do I mean by initial and final? I don't know. That's up to you. You get to choose what you mean by initial and final. One of those should be a time when you know everything about the energy. The other should be a time when you're looking for information. 
Whichever one happened earlier in the day is the initial. That's it. That's all there is. And every single problem is solved that way. Let's go back to this problem. When this block got to B, it had 2,000 joules of kinetic energy. And then, air capital. What kind of air? Negative air due to the friction. And that bled all the energy out of my bucket, and I was left with no energy. So I would solve that by starting with this equation. Energy initial plus their texture. Ver is equal to energy final. Now, initially, that block just has kinetic energy. There's no springs and it's on the level floor. So I have kinetic energy and I have 2,000 joules. The ver is going to be negative because the friction force is acting this way while the block is going that way. So that's going to be minus the friction force. It's kinetic friction because I can hear the scraping going on. That's by the floor on the block times the distance. And that equals, when it stops, zero energy. Now you can see if I'm looking for delta x, if I know the friction force, I'm done. Well, I've known how to find a friction force for a long time now. I draw a free body diagram. The weight of that block is 100 newtons. There's the normal force by the floor on the block. That's 100 newtons. And then there's this friction force. It's kinetic friction, so it's mu times the normal force. But these indices have to be the same. And so this is going to be 0.2 times 100, or 20 newtons. So if I come back here and I say 2,000 joules minus 20 newtons times x is equal to zero, solve for x, you get 100 meters, as this gentleman back here did. OK? Now, let's talk about that problem that you voted off the island. It's that problem right there. Only instead of a box, you've got a car. That car is going at 20 kilometers per hour. That's 12 miles an hour. You're not going to get to Denver anytime soon. That's slow. And we're told that you're on a level road. You slam on the brake so that it, it locks the wheels. And you slide. And you slide a distance of 10 meters. Well, then we're asked, what if that car were going four times faster, 80 kilometers per hour? And what if it was the same car on the same road and we slammed the wheel or slammed the brakes? How far would it slide? Now, this problem got voted off the island because you didn't have much information. You didn't get the mass of the car. You didn't get the coefficient of kinetic friction of the road. Man, it seemed like someone wasn't doing their job. But I promise you that everything you need is right there in that problem. Let me show you how to do this. It's the same problem. I'm going to start the same place. My initial energy before we slam the brakes is kinetic. One half m v initial squared. My final energy after I come to a halt is zero. And those are not the same because there's friction done. This is by the road, on the car, over a distance. And it's negative air because the friction is acting opposite the motion. Now, 
I don't know what the mass is. But I know it's the same whether the car is going fast or slow. I don't know what the friction between the road and the car is. But I know it's the same car on the same road. So it's the same friction. Friction doesn't depend on how fast you're sliding. Just on the normal force and the coefficient of kinetic friction. It's the same. Now, is it going to hurt your feelings if I rewrite this V squared as V initial times V initial? Is that? That's still the same, right? If that second, that second slide, the car is going four times faster, this gets four times bigger. But so does this. And that means that the positive part of this equation gets 16 times bigger. Now, if this equation is still going to add up to zero, with the positive part of it getting 16 times bigger, then the negative part has to get 16 times bigger. And if the friction is staying the same, that means that this delta x has to get 16 times bigger. What that means is that delta x for the fast car is going to be 16 times delta x for the slow car, or 160 meters. Now some of you may have gotten that answer and rejected it as silly. That's a football field and a half. You slam on your brakes and you slide for a football field and a half? That's ridiculous. Well, it's not very physical because the first assumption wasn't very physical. If you're only going 12 miles an hour and you completely lock your brakes and slide for a whole 10 meters, you're on the slipperiest ice we've ever seen. That is Hatter, Montana in December, okay? That is one slippery road. Now, here's another thing that makes this a little bit unrealistic, is that when you hit your brakes, you hear a machine gun going off. At least I hope you do. If you hear a machine gun going off when you hit your brakes on a slippery road, that means your parents love you. Okay, because that's the anti-lock brake system. What that anti-lock brake system does is that the calipers grab the disc to stop the car. As soon as it senses that the car is about to slip, it lets go. And then it grabs again. And as soon as it feels like it's going to slip, it lets go. And that's what the ra -da 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 -da. that's your calipers going in and out and in and out and in and out. If when you hit the brakes, all you hear is a scraping of the tires against the, the road, you need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your parents. It should start, why don't you love me? What have I done? What have I done? Okay, get them to get you a new car. Now, you know, you know that when you took that driver's exam to get your license, the hardest part of the written exam was how far are you going to slide? And there was a table that you had to memorize, and it was very complex. Now, the physics would suggest that, hey, you're going twice as fast, you're going to slide twice as far. Did I say that? I did not. You're going to say I said that, but I'll call you liars. If you're going twice as fast, you'll slide four times as far. That's what I meant to say, okay? Because you'll have four times the energy. But the table that you had to memorize was more complicated than that. And that's because here we're assuming that as soon as you see that elk, you've hit that brake. But in the driver's test, they assume that, oh, you see the elk, and then you do, oh my goodness, an elk. And then you hit the brake. They take into account that, oh my goodness time, which is independent of velocity. <laughs> so, Questions on this problem? I solved it using a technique called proportional reasoning. 
It is one of the most important skills to have as a human being. Unfortunately, it's one of the uh, skills that we often do not teach in schools. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, the ability to say, hey, if this changes by two, this changes by four. That's, if you're gonna be a future science teacher, I would beg you to teach your students that skill. Okay. Now here's where I come clean. Here's where I show you where these formulas come from. And I'm gonna show you in a way that's not gonna hurt, okay? I told you that when I did this up front, people fell asleep, but now it's quick and painless, and now it's gonna mean something to you. Watch. If I take a box, and I move it up a distance H, and I do it in a special way, the box was always already moving slowly when you opened your eyes. And it kept moving slowly at a constant rate all the way up. Now if I look at the buckets, down here, because it's moving, it's got some kinetic energy. But if I call this height zero, I don't have any gravitational energy and there's no springs in this problem. So that's my total energy. When I get up there, I've got exactly the same amount of kinetic energy that I started with. I did not fill that bucket. But the gravitational bucket got filled. And that changed the total energy. Now the only way you can change the total energy is to do varying. And if the total energy got bigger, that means the varic was positive. Well, what did the positive varic? The ham. And I can calculate that varic very easily. It's the force exerted by the hand times the distance. Well, the distance is just h. What about the force by the hand? Does this hand have to push more than the weight, less than the weight, or equal to the weight to make it go up? Equal. equal. It's going up at a constant velocity, zero acceleration. So the force by the hand is equal to the weight, which is mg. And that's the distance, is h. It was done to fill up that bucket was mgh. And that's my formula for gravitational potential energy. You see what we did? We contrived a way to fill only that one bucket by doing work. And because we have a formula for how we do work, we were able to get a formula for how we fill the bucket. Let's try it again, but this time let's try it for the spring, okay? I have a spring that came out of the box that long. This is the equilibrium position for the, block, uh, the spring. And then I take that block and I start from rest. This is important. I start from rest. I push slowly and I stop. I start from rest and I end at rest. Now, again, the goal is to only fill one bucket. Since I start from rest and I end from rest, there's no kinetic energy. Since I stay on the floor, there's no gravitational energy. The only bucket that gets filled is the spring bucket. I go from no energy to some energy. And that means my total energy bucket goes from nothing to something. By the Verrick energy formula, that can only happen if positive Verrick is being done. Well, I can calculate that Verrick. It's the force times the distance. Well, the distance is just delta S. And the force is given by Hooke's law. Hook, 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 hook. And that says that the force by the spring is equal to K times delta S. Now, if I want to push that block at a slow, constant rate, I have to push just as hard as the spring, which is K delta S. So if I take my push of K delta S, I multiply by the distance of delta S, I get K delta S squared, which is 
That's the energy stored in the spring. Again, we did it. Pretty nice, huh? We good? Yes. There we go. Oh, come on. People, you're better than that. You're better than that. What? What about the one half? What about that one half? Are we gonna are we gonna make me a liar over a half? Yes. Let's think about that push. As I start pushing this spring, initially, it's not very hard. The spring's not very compressed. I can push it easy. And then it gets more compressed, it gets harder. And then it gets really hard. And then it gets really hard. So it goes from easy to hard. The only place where I'm pushing with that value of K delta S is there, when the spring is already compressed by delta S. I start out pushing with nothing. Which force do you want to use when the force is changing? The biggest or the smallest? Average. The average. And the average between that biggest and smallest is halfway in between. And so what I want to use is the average force times the distance. And that gives me the half. And that gives me the formula for filling up that spring bucket. Now folks, there's another class that meets in this room. They call themselves calc-based physics. It's filled with a bunch of engineers. And they derived that formula using calculus. And they felt all warm and fuzzy about themselves for doing so. I'm thinking they wasted their time. <laughs> you have to use calculus to derive that formula. You're not thinking very clearly, okay? This, all we need is the average force, the average force. Are there questions on those derivations? Was it indeed painless? Nod your head. Good. Thank you. Now, I have here a loop-de-loop. -loop loop de loop and as you can see, it goes loop de loop Now, I have a line drawn right here, and that line is at exactly the same height as that point right there. So let me start that ball right at the line. Okay, and it comes up to about here and then turns around. I'll show you that again. About right to there. So, my question for you, as the marble goes around the loop-de-loop, -loop, does its mechanical energy increase, decrease, or stay the same? Please use your clicker to answer that question. <laughs> starts from rest. Does it have kinetic energy, yes or no? No. Does it have spring energy? No or heck no? Heck no, there's no springs. So the only mechanical energy I have here is gravitational, mgh, where h is however high it is above the zero point, whatever we call zero. Now, when it came to here, it had to stop to turn around. It was only stopped for an instant, but it had to stop to turn around. Does it have any kinetic energy? No. Any spring energy? Heck no. So again, all of its energy is gravitational. Does it have as much gravitational as it had before? No. 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 So the, the mechanical energy was decreased. That was the correct answer, decreased. Okay? Now, if this were a frictionless loop-to-loop, -loop, 
The first thing you'd notice is I let go of it and it wouldn't roll, it would slide. Without friction, I can't get this thing rolling. Now, if I did that on a frictionless track, it would slide down around and it would come right up to here before turning around. It would come up to exactly the same height. That's what you learned in the tutorial this week. Did you not? I hope, I hope, on page four. Okay, now, why would a frictionless track allow the energy to be conserved? It's still pushing on the ball. Why is that not doing any work? Because work is only in the same direction as motion. Exactly. It's always pushing perpendicular to the way the ball is going. That allows us to write problems on exams that look impossible. I can write a problem that has a, a, a roller coaster that has 55 loop-de-loops with a twist. <laughs> You know, and as long as it's a frictionless roller coaster, no work is done. The energy is conserved because the normal force is always perpendicular to the motion. Likewise, we can write problems that involve Tarzan swings. And because the Tarzan swing is always pulling along the vine, and Tarzan's always moving perpendicular to the vine, the Tarzan swing does no work. That looks funny for a fat man, doesn't it? <laughs> you should see me dance. And you should. Okay. Now, that allows me to ask problems that are kind of messy. And yet, they're pretty darn easy. This is an old exam problem. I love it. It's got potential energy, kinetic energy, spring energy. It's got friction. It's got it all. <coughs> Now, on the back of this page, there's a special problem that will be due next Wednesday. It's not part of this homework assignment, but it will be part of the next homework assignment. down this frictionless track to B, and then it encounters a rough patch that's two meters long. And then it bounces into this spring. The spring causes it to reverse direction and go back the other way. Now, the first question on this problem, when it was on an exam, was only worth two points, meaning it's easy peasy. Find the work, see we misspelled it there. Find the work, if any, done by the ramp on the system as the block moves from A to B. Now, the answer, of course, is zero. And everyone in the class got that right. But most people in the class only got one of the two points. Because they said, there's zero work because it's a frictionless ramp. Well, that doesn't prove it. The ramp is still pushing on the block. You need to argue that it's pushing perpendicular to the motion and hence does zero work. Now it gets interesting. Find the kinetic energy of the block at point B. With your neighbor, give that a try. See what you can come up with. Thank <laughs> you. 
When you get an answer to part B, raise your hand, please. Okay, let's do it together. This problem caused a morale problem in my class. Because when I posted the exam, my solution, my solution to this problem was this. And I had some upset students. They came at me, they just said, Greg, you lying sack of spit. <laughs> you told us the kinetic energy was one half mv squared, you even made us memorize it, and then on the exam, you, you changed your mind. It's not one half mv squared anymore, it's mgh. You lying sack of spit. Now, all I did in my defense was skip a few steps. What I should have put on the solution key was that initial energy is equal to final energy unless there's work done. Well, I'm going to choose my initial point to be A. I'm going to choose my final point to be B. Because I know the energy at A, I'm looking for the energy at B. I just said that there's no verk done by the trap between A and B, so I've got zero verk. I then say, at A, what kinds of energy do I have? Well, the block's not moving, no kinetic. The spring's not compressed, no spring. I've got potential energy, gravitational potential energy. I then go to point B and I ask, what flavors of energy do I have? Well, it's moving, so I have kinetic. It's on the floor, so I don't have any gravitational, and the spring's not compressed yet. No spring. And then I reminded myself, this is what I'm looking for. So if I know this, I know that. So I said, well, this is just M, G, H, and A is equal to the kinetic energy of B. And that's what got me in trouble, okay? There's those steps in between. If I know the potential energy at A, and I know that I didn't get robbed as I went from A to B, then I know the kinetic energy at B. Check to see if your neighbor's okay with that, or if they're still upset about the lie. Yes. So what we're saying is that I had 80 joules here, I must still have 80 joules there. And then we get robbed, okay? So, next thing we wanna find here is the magnitude of the frictional force by the rough section of track. Can you do that in your head? Good, what did you get? It's a 10 kilogram block. That means the weight's going to be 100. The normal's going to be 100. I take that normal and I multiply it by the 0.3. I get a friction force of 30 newtons. You ought to be able to do that in your head. Then we ask, how much kinetic energy do we have at C? Well, we go back to the same starting point. The energy initial is equal to the energy final, except when it's not. Well, if as initial I take B, and as final I take C, I know that at B I had 80 joules of kinetic energy. 
I then have negative fair done by 30 newtons over a distance of 2 meters, and that's going to give me my kinetic energy at C. This is going to be 80 minus 60 is equal to the kinetic energy at C. So this is just like this is just like uh, well, like finances. You're walking down the street with eighty dollars, and someone steals you. They take sixty dollars. What you got left? That's all there is. And then we're told that the spring constant has a a value of one hundred and sixty newtons per meter. How far is it compressed? What's the delta S of the spring? That delta X should be a delta S, I'm sorry. When the block comes to a momentary halt. You know, do that on your own. We're out of time. Have a good weekend, people.